Seikan Tunnel connects the Japanese islands of Honshu and Hokkaido. It is the world's longest undersea tunnel. Making it took 24 years. Tunneling beneath the seabed entailed a constant battle against leaking water. The enormously challenging work claimed many lives. Now a project is underway to extend the Shinkansen bullet train service through the Seikan Tunnel by 2016. This time on Japanology Plus, our theme is the Seikan Tunnel. We'll dig deep into the dedicated effort and technological know-how that helped to create this monumental undersea structure. Hello and welcome to a rather blustery edition of Japanology Plus. I'm Peter Barakan. I'm standing at the very northern tip of Honshu, the largest Japanese island, at a place called Cape Tapi. And behind me, down some very steep cliffs, is the Strait of Tsugaru, which divides Honshu with the northerly island of Hokkaido. They say that you can see Hokkaido on a clear day, but clear days are a bit of a precious commodity in these parts, especially at this time of year. What you're seeing now, howling winds and blizzards, is pretty much normal. Now, right underneath where I am now, and a long way under, way underneath the seabed, is a tunnel that connects Honshu with Hokkaido. It's called the Seikan Tunnel. Why would anybody in their right mind want to dig a tunnel under that? Connecting two of Japan's main islands, Honshu and Hokkaido, the Seikan Tunnel is the world's longest undersea tunnel. It is 53.85 kilometers long. 23.3 kilometers of that is beneath the seabed. At its deepest point, the Seikan Tunnel is 240 meters below sea level. These days, 51 freight trains and 31 passenger trains traverse the Seikan Tunnel each day. Express trains take about 30 minutes to pass through. Given the Seikan Tunnel's length and depth, extremely strict safety standards are in place. To give one example, diesel trains are not allowed through the tunnel since their fuel is flammable and all trains must turn off any combustion engines. Periodic disaster readiness exercises are conducted to ensure rapid response should a fire or accident occur. And in the event of an emergency, a service tunnel is equipped with passages that lead back to land. These and other measures ensure that the Seikan Tunnel is safe and can function as a crucial route for people and goods between Honshu and Hokkaido. I'm in Fukushima now, a place in Hokkaido which served as a base for construction here on the Hokkaido side of the Seikan Tunnel. And over here, is a museum where they have some exhibits of the history of the construction and the equipment used. And this is where I'm going to be meeting my guest for today. Let's go on inside, because it's cold. Good morning. Konnichiwa. Hello. This is Mr. Toshio Kadoya, who was the leader of the excavation team on the tunnel for 18 years. Toshio Kadoya was born in 1935. For 18 years, he worked on the building of the Seikan Tunnel. He now works as a volunteer guide at the Seikan Tunnel Museum, sharing his insights on this project of the century with younger generations. As soon as you walk in here, you're greeted by this enormous monstrosity here. I have no idea what this is. 
Well, the original idea was to use tunnel boring machines, like the one you see here, to dig out the Seikan tunnel. This boring machine was built in Switzerland for that purpose. Using this machine, it was estimated that the work would be done quite quickly, in 10 years. That was the initial plan. A boring machine presses its cutting heads against a rock face, grinding away rock and extending a tunnel. These machines are often used in major tunneling projects, but they turned out to be useless for this project. The soil was too soft and couldn't support the weight of the machine. It was sinking into the floor. They made improvements to the machine and tried again, but eventually they gave up. They switched to excavation using manpower. In 1964, Tokyo hosted the Olympic Games. Japan's economy was booming. A number of historic infrastructure projects, including the Shinkansen bullet train service and Tokyo's expressways, were being constructed. That same year, work began on the Seikan Tunnel. One reason the government wanted the tunnel was that in 1954, a typhoon had devastated a ferry service connecting Honshu and Hokkaido. Five ships sank, and more than 1,400 lives were lost. This disaster spurred calls for a safer route between the islands, and so a massive project was launched. The plan called for a rail tunnel. Boring would proceed simultaneously from the Hokkaido and Honshu sites. The first phase was the drilling of a pilot tunnel to study geological formations and determine whether a rail tunnel was in fact feasible. Initially, the Seikan tunnel was to be completed in 10 years. But six years in, the plan was revised the tunnel would be made larger to accommodate Shinkansen trains. Kanoya joined the construction crew when he was 30. Before that, he had been a fisherman, but declining catches prompted him to try a new line of work. Kanoya's job was right at the work face, moving the tunnel forward. He was in charge of an excavation team of around 20 men. So, oh, these are the exhibits. Mm. So, what have we got here? I know you were working mm. right down there with the ex excavation team. Perhaps you could guide us around some of this stuff, tell us how it was used. This is called a jack leg drill. It's for making holes in the tunnel face. Depending on the properties of the rock, the amount of dynamite to pack in the holes is decided. The dynamite blasts away the rock, extending the tunnel forward. So you, op you make a hole with this and then you stuff the dynamite in there? Exactly. Sometimes the rock is too soft for dynamiting. Holes can't be drilled in it. In that case, we use this, a coal pick. We use these to manually excavate the rock and advance the tunnel. Tough doesn't even begin to describe it. Where the rock was hard, we drilled and blasted. Where the rock was soft, we dug with picks, advancing one meter, then another, then another. We started digging down from the land. Eventually, we reached sea level. In other words, the level where the surface of the sea would be. And then we got to 20 or 30 meters below that. That's where the seawater started seeping in. It came gurgling in from the tunnel walls all around us. The water was spurting in all the time, like this. And beyond that point, it was a never-ending battle against the leaks. Construction of the Seikan Tunnel was extremely difficult. The crew had to battle constantly to hold back the seawater. 
In 1976, the project hit its biggest crisis when 80 tons of seawater a minute began leaking in. 1.5 kilometers of tunnel flooded. It took five months to get back on track. In order to tunnel through unstable rock, a method of reinforcing the rock prior to digging was developed. First, cement and sealants were pumped into a large section of rock ahead to make it solid and stable. Then, excavation could proceed. This way, the crew was able to staunch the flow of seawater and gradually push the tunnel face forward. Conditions were brutal. Inside the tunnel, it was over 30 degrees Celsius, with humidity above 90%. Work at the tunnel face was often done knee-deep in water. 24 hours a day, in three eight-hour shifts, the tunnel construction progressed. Under these grueling conditions, a series of accidents claimed 34 lives. On Kadoya's own crew, there were three fatalities, including a man crushed by heavy equipment. You actually lost three of your friends uh, during the excavation. And as their team leader, how did you feel about that when it happened? I lost one older guy, one younger guy, uh, one guy around my age. Their death was a heavy burden. Mm. I felt I had to honour the work that they had done on this project. It made me more determined than before to see the Seikan tunnel through to the end. I vow to complete the tunnel for them. 1983, 19 years after construction began, the moment came for the pilot tunnels being drilled from each side to finally link up. Here came Kadoya's most nerve-wracking task, setting the dynamite that would bring down the final wall of rock between the two tunnels. The charges would be detonated by the Prime Minister himself from his office in Tokyo. There could be absolutely no mistake with that blast, the detonation. The whole world was watching the event. I'm not exaggerating. The level of pressure was indescribable. We were so nervous, we could barely twist the wire leads together. There were these thin little wires. Normally, we breeze through the wiring. And with no electric light, we worked by lamplight. We were trying to keep each other calm, saying, stay cool, stay focused, and somehow we got it done. Finally, the big moment arrived. Papa! Last, a cool breeze blew through the tunnel. That day, people were crying and shouting, Banzai! They were overjoyed. But as for me, I felt completely drained. I just went and slumped against a wall. Oh. Did you think back on your three friends that had died during the process? Yes. More than anything, I thought of those three friends. Honestly, that was what it was all about for me. Help me, boys, wherever you are. That's what I was praying at the moment of the blast and throughout the digging. And I shouted, I did it! I wanted to tell them I completed the tunnel. We're through.
In 1988, 24 years after construction started, the Seikan Tunnel opened and the first trains rolled under the seabed beneath the Tsugaru Strait. Hi, I'm Matt Alt, and today I'm in the city of Aomori. This gigantic ship that you can see behind me is a train ferry. It was designed to ferry not only people, but entire passenger trains across the strait. The Seikan Train Ferry was first built in 1908, and it served for over 80 years until 1988, when the Seikan Tunnel was built, linking Honshu and Hokkaido. Today, the Seikan Train Ferry has been decommissioned, and it serves as a floating museum full of materials about this historic ship. Let's go check it out. Ah, oh, hello. Oh, the wall. Hello, thank you for coming. This is Mr. Kasai, and he's a former crew member of this ship, and he's gonna tell me the story of how it came to be. Well, first of all, I can see that the passenger seats are still in place here. So this Yes, these were what we call the green seats, the first class seats. The ship's total passenger capacity was 1,280 people. It served everyone. The ferry was the main way to get across the strait, so almost everyone used it. So it played a pretty indispensable role in people's lives, I guess. Yes, it did, that's right. It was really the only form of transport between Hokkaido and Honshu. And it didn't only transport people to Honshu, but also coal and timber, seafood and farm produce. It made a significant contribution to Japan's economic development. Down here is the train deck. Wow, this is pretty incredible. This is huge. I don't think I've ever been inside of a, a ship this big before. How many trains can you get on at the same time? 48 cars, 288 meters long in total when connected. You would fit them in four lines, as you can see here. So what's this, uh, what's this big blue train here? This is a postal train. Ah, I can, yeah, I can see the postal mark on the side. So the post office would actually run this train. There was what they called train mail. Four postal employees would ride in this car and they would sort the mail during the journey. It was a postal service between Hokkaido and Honshu. So how did they get these giant trains onto the ship? See these lines here? These are the rails. And if you come over here, Oh, wow. This is the stern hatch. When the ship docks, these two doors fold up and lift hydraulically, and the freight train rolls on. This is one big door. Wow, look at the size of this thing. Well, it looks like these are the big doors we saw from the inside. Yes, that's the stern hatch we saw from the inside just now. And this is the movable bridge for loading the trains. It has three track connections, and these tracks go in the direction of Aomori Station. Well, now that the, the ship has been decommissioned, what do you see as, the, as being the legacy for the Hakodamaru? This ship is a technological marvel. It's an important piece of our country's heritage. I hope that it will continue to be used to educate many people in the years ahead. We're always happy to welcome visitors. Well, thank you so much for showing me around. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming. We're in a place called Kikonai now, and the reason we're wearing these helmets is not to protect us from the snow, but because it's a construction site. And what they're building over here is a station. Uh, it's going to be the first station that the Shinkansen trains stop at when they come out of the Seikan Tunnel, and those trains are due to start running in the spring of 2016. 
Preparations to launch a Shinkansen service to Hakodate, a city in Hokkaido, are progressing. Hakodate is one of Hokkaido's most popular tourist destinations, and there are high hopes that the Shinkansen's arrival will boost the local economy. At present, the Shinkansen terminates in Aomori. Once the line to Hakodate has been opened, there are plans to extend it to Sapporo within the next 15 years or so. The Seikan Tunnel was renovated to handle bullet trains as well as the conventional trains that have always run through it. The first step was laying the rail. The Shinkansen uses a wider gauge than ordinary trains, so new rails had to be installed. The new rails, which flank the existing ones, are for the Shinkansen. Test runs of bullet trains through the Seikan Tunnel began in December 2014. Only one year to go. I'm really excited. The Seikan Tunnel was originally meant to accommodate Shinkansen trains. Now, 50 years after digging began, that goal is finally set to become a reality. Toshio Kadoya, who worked so hard to build the Seikan Tunnel, is eagerly awaiting the opening of the Hokkaido Shinkansen service. We spent decades digging that tunnel, and the goal was for the Shinkansen to run through it. That becoming a reality is extremely moving. It means so much to me. It fills me with joy. But there is still a matter to resolve before the Shinkansen can run through the Seikan Tunnel. It's not an ideal environment for bullet trains and freight trains to share. Shinkansen trains have a top speed of 260 km per hour. Freight trains have a top speed of just 100 km per hour. If they pass each other at those speeds, the wind pressure could cause freight containers to tip over. And since a bullet train will rapidly catch up to any freight train ahead of it, only a limited number of Shinkansen trains will run. The Hokkaido Railway Company, the operator, has studied the development of a so-called train-on-train system. It involves special freight cars with rails inside onto which ordinary freight cars can be piggybacked. These cars will be pulled by Shinkansen engines, allowing freight to travel at high speed. But the system is not yet ready to be introduced. For now, it's been decided that the top speed of Shinkansen trains inside the tunnel will be 140 km per hour, similar to current express trains. This will make the Shinkansen journey from Tokyo 4 hours and 10 minutes, 18 minutes longer than what's really possible with Shinkansen. It's feared that this will harm competitiveness with air transport. Keiichi Sato of the Hokkai School of Commerce, who's been studying the logistics of the Seikan Tunnel, underlines the economic significance of the Hokkaido Shinkansen. If the only consideration were the Shinkansen, then reducing freight trains would be best. But that would be a huge blow to Hokkaido's economy. Freight trains carry Hokkaido's agricultural products. The ability to transport produce affects the viability of the entire agricultural sector. And that's a sector at the core of Hokkaido's economy. The moment of truth is approaching. As we prepare to make a decision, we must think very seriously about this matter. Is there any way for full-speed bullet trains to safely share the Seikan Tunnel with freight trains? 
The experts are working hard to find an answer to this question. For the goods trains and the bullet trains to both run at the same time, I know there are various problems, uh, including safety issues as well. Again, what are your feelings on that? We always wanted it to be a safe tunnel, one that wasn't vulnerable to accidents. If an accident does happen once the Shinkansen starts running, our work will have been for nothing. That's how I would feel. It's very difficult to have regular trains, bullet trains and freight trains running on the same tracks. Extremely difficult. But I want them to get everything running smoothly, running perfectly, and also running safely through the Seikan tunnel. That's what I'd like to say. I'm really hoping they can make that happen. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm going to be getting on the train here, going through the tunnel. So wish me luck, and thank you very much for being with us today. It's been very interesting hearing your experiences. I know we're in the tunnel now because I could feel the pressure on my ears. And I can remember Kadoya-san earlier on talking about how the pressure was quite strong in the tunnel. You had to have your earplugs in all the time. Not only that, but I'm you know, thinking about how he was in here eight hours a day, 18 years, in that debilitating heat and humidity, sometimes having to dig the dirt almost with their hands. How they did it is it almost beggar's belief. On the other hand, pretty soon now, you're going to be able to go from Tokyo to Hakodate in about four hours in a bullet train. So I suppose you have to say it was worth it. Pretty amazing anyway. I'd take my hat off to it, or at least I would if I had one. See you next time. Next time on Japanology Plus, Snow Country. Nearly half of Japan's landmass receives heavy snowfall. We'll look at the traditional know-how and latest attractions of a fascinating region.